rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Here's today's prophecy update. The U.S. and Iran have reached a secret agreement that allows Tehran not to implement several parts of its nuclear deal with the Western powers, according to a Reuters report. The U.S. is said to have made the concessions so that Iran can meet the deal's deadlines and that sanctions can be lifted. The secret agreement allows Iran to exceed the limitations on the amount of low enriched uranium that it can possess. The study points out that the cancellation of the monitoring of the amount of low enriched uranium will prevent the International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors from keeping track of Iran's enriched uranium that could be used for manufacturing nuclear weapons. These continual compromises with Iran concerning its future nuclear capability are especially alarming in light of the prophecies of the Bible. Ezekiel 38 verse 5 through 8 explicitly prophesies that Iran, which is Persia, will participate in the invasion of Israel at the time of the Battle of Armageddon. The nuclear deal with Iran is allowing Iran to prepare for that time when Iran, along with Russia and Turkey, will attempt to wipe Israel off the map. Well, the events of today continue to coincide perfectly with the prophecies of the Bible. And it's not a rare coincidence, it's an almost daily occurrence. Every day when I'm perusing the news, I find myself looking at articles that fit like a hand in a glove with the prophecies of the Bible. It is stunning. It's almost enough to make a person's hair stand on end. That's where we are right now. It is amazing and it's also exciting when you see prophecies written in the Bible 2,000, 2,500 years ago coming to pass just like they're synchronized. Well, it makes you know, number one, that the Bible is true. It's a supernatural book and there is a God behind the entire thing. It is a thrilling, amazing, wonderful situation. I'd like to talk to you today about something that we don't talk about that much, but it's coming soon. And so I wanna to talk to you about it today. I wanna to talk to you about the mark of the beast. Some people know it as 666. It's one of the prophecies in the Bible that sort of make your heart stop and it sort of causes your blood to turn cold when you think about this prophecy, but a lot of people don't know much about it. I want you to know more about it by the time this program is done today. I wanna to take you through some of the prophecies that actually tell us about the mark of the beast. The first one I want us to look at is Revelation chapter number 13, verse 16 through 18. Now, before we actually read it, let me lay the groundwork. Revelation 13 is the single chapter that's devoted to the one world government, the one world religion, and the one world economy of the end time. It outlines in a very succinct way 
the program of the Antichrist and his global plan. It's really Satan's plan. It starts out with verses 1 through 8 devoted to the Antichrist and his one world government. Verses 11 through 15 are devoted to the false prophet and his one world religion. And then verse number 16 through 18 is devoted to the economic system of the end time world government and the enforcement mechanism, as we're going to see today, to cause every person to conform to the one world government and the one world religion. Already, the international community uses economic pressure to force nations to obey the edicts of the UN. The Bible prophesies this is going to be taken down to the individual level. Let's read about it now. Revelation 13, starting with verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast or calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man and his number is 600, three score and six or 666. So this particular passage talks of an economic system that is coming that a person will have to have this mark or this number in their hand or their forehead or they will not be allowed to buy or sell. It's going to be a number that will give you access to the world's economy. Now we're closer than most of us care to think because most nations already have a national ID and most nations require that national ID for most economic transactions and in particular for holding a job. Now, if you just boil it down to its simplest form, you got to have a number or you can't hold a job. If you don't have a job, how much buying and selling are you going to do? Very little to none. Now, this is what this particular passage prophesies for the end time. We've already seen Iran come through some severe economic sanctions recently. They're not totally out from under them yet. But the UN passed these sanctions against Iran and said, you're going to do this, 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 and this, or else we're going to punish you economically. The nations of the world are going to gang up on you and we're going to choke you. Well, that forced Iran to the negotiating table. Thus, the deal with the P5 plus one powers, the five, the big five of the United Nations plus Germany, that signed the deal that we now are enforcing right today or failing to enforce depending on the latest breaking story. Okay, so you get the picture. You got one world government, one world religion, and then these last three verses talk about the enforcement mechanism. If you do not pledge allegiance to the world government and if you do not conform to the global belief system, then you're not going to be allowed to buy or sell. It's going to be a form of individual economic sanction. The Bible even says in some places, the penalty for refusal will be death. Now time is coming in the not too distant future and this shouldn't be hard to envision because we've had it happen several times in the last 100 years. Stalin, they say, killed around 60 million people because they refused to comply politically and religiously. Mao Zedong, the late leader of China, he killed about 60 million people because they refused to comply. So this is not some far-fetched thing. I mean, Mao Zedong, the, the Chinese Cultural Revolution, uh, that was way back in the 50s and 60s. So 50, 60 years ago, Stalin 100 years ago or so. And then we think it couldn't happen again. Ladies and gentlemen, 
it's going to happen again. And very soon. You say, how soon? Oh, six years, seven, eight. I don't know for sure. But not 15 or 20 or 30. We're too close. All the prophecies are culminating right now. Now, I'm going to show you how close we are to a cashless society before we're finished today. But I want you to see exactly what the Bible says about the mark of the beast. If you don't take it, and the, the sinful thing will be, you will have to, quote, worship the Antichrist. And in so doing, you will really be worshiping Satan. Because verse number 2 of the 13th chapter says that the dragon, which is Satan, gave this world government its seat, its power, and great authority. Every bit of this is, is designed to force the human race to worship Satan through this personage called the Antichrist. So the punishment, if you don't take the mark, is you'll be frozen out of the economy and possibly you will be put to death by the Antichrist and his one world government. However, let's play the other side of that record because there's a punishment for taking the mark of the beast. Revelation 14, 9 through 11 gives us God's punishment to anyone that pledges allegiance to the one world government, the Antichrist, and thus to Satan himself. Revelation 14, 9 through 11, here's what it says. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, speaking of Jesus Christ, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So here's the stark choice. You either can't buy or sell or you're going to be punished forever in the flames of hell according to the Bible. Now, you can choose to believe the Bible or you can choose to throw it in the trash can. You can do what you want to do with it. But I'm called to preach the gospel and I'm called to tell you what the Bible says. Then you are called to choose whether you believe it or not. I have found the Bible to be 100% true. Now, I'm not talking about your neighbor or your boss at work or your fellow church member. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. Every single one of us will face this choice in the very near future, according to the prophecies of the Bible. Revelation 15, 2 gives us more information about the mark of the beast. It says there, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. So they're probably not going to put 666 on your forehead or on your hand. It may be a name or it may be the number of his name. Somehow his name will equate to 666 or the mark of his name. Do you notice the different ways it's phrased here? So it's going to be disguised. I mean, if, if they come out with a branding iron to brand you with 666, there's a good chance a lot of people will say, no, I'm not doing that. But it's going to be a little more subtle than that. So all these people who do not take the mark, well, they're going to stand on a sea of glass having the harps of God. They're going to find themselves ushered into the presence of the Lord. There's another scripture that goes into more detail about those who refuse 
to take the mark because of their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 20, verse four through six. And I saw thrones. Now this is at the end of the battle of Armageddon. This is, the, this is at the second coming of Jesus. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. I mean, they had their heads cut off. And for the word of God and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. They stood steadfast. They refused. And yes, some of them did lose their lives. But the Bible tells us what happened to these people. It goes on to say here in verse four, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Let's pause right there. The Bible teaches there's a first resurrection and a second resurrection. The first resurrection happens at the coming of Jesus to the earth. The Bible tells us that when he comes, all of those who are born again, both dead and alive, will be caught up to meet him in the air. The Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain in the faith will be changed from mortal to immortal beings, and then we will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. The Bible says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So we're gonna be caught up to meet Jesus in the sky. We will then go with him to the battle of Armageddon. That event is called the first resurrection. Notice what verse six says about those who are in the first resurrection. Remember, they're the ones who didn't take the mark, didn't worship the beast. Here's what verse six says, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power because they now have eternal life. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. The Bible teaches when Jesus comes back, he's going to put down all human governments, replacing those governments with his own government made up of his people, his saints. The Bible says that we will rule and reign as kings and priests with Jesus Christ for the entire 1,000 year millennial reign. Now during that time, there's going to be peace on earth, goodwill toward men. There won't be one war for a thousand years. Plus, all of us that have been a partaker of the first resurrection, we will have eternal life. Later on in the chapter, it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, for on such the, dec the second death hath no power. Now, there's a great white throne of judgment coming at the end of the 1,000 year reign. But if you are part of the first resurrection, you have immortality. As a matter of fact, you will not appear before the great white throne of judgment. The Bible actually teaches that those people who were counted worthy to be a participant in the first resurrection will actually sit on thrones judging the other people of the earth, that we will judge even angels that have been disobedience. You remember one third of the angels rebelled against Jesus Christ. Now let's pause just a moment because I want to make sure that you really understand. What I have just said to you is straight from God's holy word. It's going to happen. There is not a 1% chance that it will not happen. It is spoken of repeatedly throughout the scriptures. There is coming a time when the Antichrist will reign and it will come quicker than you and I think. All it takes is one global catastrophe and the Bible prophesies that global catastrophe is coming at us right now. The Bible prophesies a war that will emanate from the Euphrates River that will kill one third of the human race. You talk about speeding up the progress toward a one world government, that will do it. And oh, by the way, all four of the nations that house the Euphrates River are fighting up and down the Euphrates today. The last nation to enter the war, the war on terror, was Turkey, and that happened last week. 
already Iran, Iraq, and Syria were engaged in the war. Now Turkey crossed Syria's border, invaded Syria last week. All four nations that house the Euphrates are now fighting up and down the Euphrates. Plus, Russia is there. The United States is there. Great Britain is there. There's a coalition of nations that also are participating there. We are already, it looks like, it looks like we're in this war right now. Now, when this war spins out of control, as it will, unless this one dies down and then comes back in another form, but it looks like to me we're too far committed. We'll have to see how that goes. All I can tell you is the Bible says there's going to be a war that will come out of the Euphrates River area, and that's where all the activity is right now. ISIS controls about 40% of the Euphrates, and we're determined to destroy ISIS, but it's not happening easy. Okay, so this prophecy of a world government, of a one world religious system, and of a system, a cashless system where everyone can be controlled with a number, it's prophesied in the Bible. I want to pause just a moment. We put together a course called Understanding in Time. I don't know of anything more important right now for you to experience than that course. Because as you can see, the events are far advanced. Understand the End Time is 14 one-hour DVDs. If you've not been through it, stop whatever you're doing right now. If you're driving, pull over the side of the road, dial this number, 800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. All you have to remember is 1-800-END-TIME, E-N-D-T-I-M-E. Dial that number and order your own copy of understanding the end time. I promise you, you go through that course. If you're not totally satisfied that you understand world events and the future like you never dreamed you could, if you're not totally satisfied, you return it and we'll refund the amount of your donation, whatever amount that was. But you need to go through that course right now because it's happening right now. Okay. I won't tell you more about that, but do call. Let's back up now. Let's go to what in fact is happening. Nations of the world are already moving toward a cashless society. You probably get your check cashless right now. You may have most of your bills paid cashless right now. We are far advanced into a cashless society. It would be so easy to transfer to a ca totally cashless society right now. If we would choose to, they're making vending machines now. Use your credit card. You don't even have to swipe it. All you have to do is be near it. Now you can use your phone to purchase things, department stores, grocery stores. It's all digital. This article is entitled Top Five Cashless Countries. Cash really is still king, but a few countries are a step ahead of the rest in toppling its throne. Given that the cost of handling cash is high, it is in the interest of governments, banks, and businesses to push for the change towards cashless. In some countries, effective policies have made a difference, whereas in others, it is thanks to consumers being more open to using mobile or plastic payments. For example, Sweden. The number of bank robberies in Sweden plunged from 110 in 2008 to 16 in 2011. Three short years. They went from 110 robberies to 16, not because security has vastly improved, but because they don't handle cash anymore. Most banks, Swede banks don't handle cash. Cash transactions are down to just 3% of the national economy. Can you believe that? Compared to 
Cash is responsible for 9% in the Eurozone and 7% in the U.S. Can you believe that? The U.S. is 7% away from being cashless. The Eurozone is 9% away from being cashless. Ladies and gentlemen, we're closer to the fulfillment of this prophecy where everyone will have a mark or a number in order to buy or sell. Now, public buses in Sweden don't accept cash, period. And three out of four of Sweden's largest banks are phasing out the manual handling of cash in bank branches. The last statistic that I heard was that there are 1,600 banks in Sweden. And of those 1,600 banks, 900 of them have no money. You can't make a cash deposit there. You cannot get cash there. 900 out of 1,600. Sweden is very close to being cashless. You need to donate money to your church in Sweden. There's a card reader at the church for that. Although Sweden is probably the closest developed country to achieving a cashless society, one researcher predicts it probably won't be before 2030. Within the Scandinavian region, Norway is also making the transition to cashless with approximately 11% of the population not carrying cash at all. However, now the latest report is that Sweden is speeding up and it may not take to 230. It may be 220 or so. It's that close. In Somaliland, Though one of Africa's poorest countries, a mobile revolution has created an informal electronic banking system. And country after country after country are going cashless. Are you ready for the mark of the beast? And would you take it if you had to? That's the burning question. To get your copy of Understand the End Time, call us. 800 End Time is the number. You've been listening to End of the Age. End Time Ministries has taught countless Bible studies about prophecy. One of our favorite places to teach is on the Mount of Olives, where Jesus will soon return, the Temple Mount, where the Third Temple will soon be built, and overlooking the Plain of Megiddo, where the Battle of Armageddon will soon be fought. Being in the place where prophecies will soon take place brings them to life in a breathtaking way. In other words, our favorite place to teach prophecy is while on our Israel Prophecy Tour. You can be a part of it. Join Irvin and Judy Baxter October 27th through November 7th for a life-changing trip. For more details, go to endtime.com or call 1-800-END-TIME. Sign up today. Time is running out. There's a specific prophecy in Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 and 33. Listen to it. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, but... The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. So right while the Antichrist is corrupting people with his false doctrines and with his flatteries, yet there's going to be a people who are strong for God. They're going to do exploits. And their assignment is the ones who understand should be instructing others who don't understand. To order End Time Ministries' bestseller, Understanding the End Time, call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. If your station does not carry the full hour of End of the Age, go to endtime.com to hear the conclusion of today's broadcast. Speaking of Somaliland, they actually state there that though one of Africa's poorest countries, a mobile revolution has created an informal electronic banking system, listen to this, with more efficiency and convenience than many far more developed countries in the world. Cash is disappearing and there is no need for credit cards because even street vendors accept payments by mobile phones. A survey in 2012, this is obviously old news, found that the average customer made 
34 transactions per month on their mobile phone in, in Somaliland. And that's higher than almost anywhere else in the world. I'm talking about the top five candidates to be the first nation to go totally cashless. Kenya. The biggest African user of mobile money is Kenya, where there are 15 million subscribers to M-Pesa. Though originally a Methodist in money home from cities to families in rural areas, M-Pesa is widely used for many things from receiving salaries to paying bills and school fees, slowly making cash obsolete. What am I talking about today? Every person will have a mark or a number without which they cannot buy or sell. It's in your Bible. It's been there 2,000 years. It's been impossible to fulfill until the last three or four or five years. It took the invention of the computer. It took the implementation of the internet and the integration of all these things. And it also took the mobile phone all these things are converging now to make this 2,000 year old prophecy possible. Now, if you're an intelligent thinking person, don't shrug this off. You know, if you're a person without an understanding, yeah, you can just sh shrug it off, say, what do I care? But if you're intelligent, think about this. This prophecy is 2,000 years old. And it took the convergence of mobile phones, internet, computers at this particular time because the Bible says this will happen in the end time. Now the Bible says while this is happening, there's also going to be a world government form. Have you heard about globalization? Do you realize that globalism is the number one issue in the present presidential campaign? That's what all the arguments about concerning our borders. Are we going to be a part of a global community or are we going to preserve our national sovereignty? It has become the leading issue in the present presidential campaign. And the Bible prophesies a world government for the times just ahead. And this economic system we're discussing today is going to be a very critical part of that world government. It is going to be the enforcement mechanism to control all the people. The Bible says both rich and poor, free and bond, will have to have this. Oh, how about Canada? As of January 1, 2013, no more new Canadian currency is being printed. They're not printing any more money in Canada. Why? First, there has been a decrease in demand for new bills. Secondly, the plastic bills have a longer life expectancy. The biggest reason, a push toward driving a cashless future. According to a poll by PayPal Canada, 56% of Canadians already would prefer to use a digital wallet than cash. When we say digital wallet, we're talking about a phone, most likely. Also, Canada is a world leader in plastic payment, where payment by credit, debit, and bank cards is almost 70% compared to a world average of 40%. Also in the top five is South Korea. Starting out at a very cash-dependent society, the Korean government has successfully put into place policies to encourage cashless behavior, which many other Asian countries can learn from. For example, South Korea introduced a preferential VAT treatment for consumers who pay with cards, moving the share of cash from 40% to 25% within 40, four years from 2002 to 2006. Think about that. From 40% being paid for by cash to 25% in four years. Four more years, where will they be? Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm talking to you about today is one of the great prophecies of the Bible for the end time. The Bible teaches when the Antichrist takes power that he will use the mark of the beast to force compliance to his political system and his religious system. So how close are we? 
Think about this. Seriously, soberly. So what has to happen? The mark of the beast will be implemented after the revealing of the beast, the Antichrist. He's to be revealed halfway through the final seven years. The final seven years will be begun by a peace agreement between Israelis and Palestinians. Vladimir Putin has recently invited Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel and Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinians to come to Russia and negotiate face to face and he would be the arbiter. Are they gonna go? Well, Netanyahu's ready now. Abbas now says he will go, but he always attaches conditions to try to avoid it because he really wants the United Nations to pass a resolution and tell Israel what it must do without him having to negotiate because most of the UN is on the side of the Palestinians. So that's where we are right now. Also, the Bible teaches we'll be moving into world government. Well, that's happening right now through globalization. That's the reason we're signing more and more of these international economic treaties that will get rid of all tariffs, all barriers, and bring all the nations together into a one world economy. We already have the World Trade Organization. The World Trade Organization has a World Trade Board. If there is a conflict, a disagreement between members of the World Trade Organization, they go before the World Trade Board and the World Trade Board makes a ruling and they're all obligated to obey it Plus, the World Trade Board has the power to fine them hundreds of millions of dollars. And do you know how many journalists are allowed to be there at the hearings of the World Trade Board? Zero. They don't want you to know how far along we are into a one world economic system because we're way far into that system right now. All the prophecies of the end time of conversion. The Bible teaches that Catholicism and, Catholicism and capitalism, Catholicism and Protestantism are going to come back together. And most Catholics and most Protestants are going to follow the Pope into an alliance with the one world governmental system. It'll be a socialist government. They'll call it social justice. Well... They already are calling it social justice, but it's simply socialism. All these things, I'm not talking about one of them or two of them. I'm talking about all of the prophecies in the Bible conversion. The Bible prophesies the rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire in the end times. Already happened. Holy Roman Empire was pronounced dead in 1806 when Napoleon defeated Holy Roman Emperor Francis II. He was the last Holy Roman Emperor. However, the Bible prophesies the Holy Roman Empire will be in power at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Guess what? The Holy Roman Empire was reborn on November 3rd of 2009 when 28 member nations signed a European constitution. They reason the United States of America has their own constitution. The United States of Europe wants to have its own constitution. They now have it. It is the empire of Charlemagne reborn. They now have Charlemagne on their money. They now have Charlemagne on their page in the Economist magazine, their most influential periodical. And it says Charlemagne every week talking about the latest developments toward European unification. And they give a $1 million prize every year to the state's person that does the most to work towards European unification. They call the prize the Charlemagne Prize. And if you want to join the reborn Holy Roman Empire, you must go to the Charlemagne Building in Brussels, Belgium, which is the capital of the European Union. Charlemagne Coin, Charlemagne Pay, Charlemagne Prize, Charlemagne Building, because Charlemagne is the father of the Holy Roman Empire. It was born in 800 AD when Pope Leo III put a crown on the head of Charlemagne, December the 25th, 800 AD. He put a crown on the head of Charlemagne, said, I now crown you emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Well, it's back. 
The Holy Roman Empire always had two leaders, political leader, spiritual leader. That's the way it's going to be again. Revelation 13 talks about the political leader in verse 1 through 8, the Antichrist. Talks about the spiritual leader in verses 11 through 15, the false prophet. There's always been two leaders in the Holy Roman Empire for a thousand years, from 800 AD until 1806. And it's getting ready to happen again. You can already see the influence right now. It'll again be a political leader from Europe and a spiritual leader from Rome. It's the way it's been every time. It's the way it's going to be the last time. And we're on the brink of the last time right now. And the mark of the beast is going to be the enforcement mechanism. I hope you're seeing the picture. Now, the last segment of our program, we're going to be taking your calls. But before this segment is over, I want to take a moment to talk to you. We don't have much time left. How much time do we have between now and the beginning of the final seven years? Could be a year, a little more or a little less. I don't know for sure, but they're determined. Conditions are converging. Israel and the Palestinians are going to be pressured into an agreement. And the Bible says there's going to be one. It will create a Palestinian state in the West Bank it will put the Temple Mount under a sharing arrangement. And many people will think this is a wonderful thing because it's going to allow the Jewish people to build their temple without disturbing the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's going to look like the answers have come. However, three and a half years after the implementation of that agreement, the Antichrist is going to declare himself to be the ultimate authority on the face of the earth. He will stand on the Temple Mount, claim to be Messiah and God. And when he does, that launches the final three and a half years called the Great Tribulation. The one issue they will not settle is going to be the status of Jerusalem. They'll put that off till the end of the agreement, till the end of the seven year agreement. And then the world community will invade Israel to force Israel to give away part of Jerusalem as the Palestinian capital. Israel will resist and will fight that will be the battle of Armageddon. So how far would you say we're away as you see all these things converging? Here's what I want to say to you. Join me. I am pledged from the top of my head to the sole of my feet to publicize into the entire world by television, by radio, by internet, by end time magazine, by conferences, by every other means. I am totally committed. I need your help. If you're not a partner with End Time Ministries yet, Please do it today. Join me. Pick up the phone, call us, 800 in time. Tell the operator, you want to be a partner with End Time Ministries. I'll be back. First Chronicles 12.32 states, And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. Jerusalem Prophecy College was created to educate the Jewish people concerning the prophecies that will come to pass in the near future. But why stop there? We want to give everyone this opportunity. That's why the online learning portion of the Jerusalem Prophecy College has been created, designed for students who desire to participate in the program but cannot attend the physical college in Jerusalem. With the online program, you can study from the convenience of your home with the flexibility to accommodate your schedule. Jerusalem Prophecy College helps to train a core group of leaders who can effectively minister to others in the end time. The next semester begins Monday, September 5th. Go to JerusalemProphecyCollege.com to register today. That's JerusalemProphecyCollege.com. Oh, I've got to tell you, Judy and I will be leaving for Israel on October the 27th. I want to invite you to go along. I can't tell you in words what it will do to your life. I've had so many people tell me it's a trip of a lifetime. I had a man go with me a few years ago on the trip. I knew he had traveled the world, Europe, Russia, Vietnam, China, all over the world. And while we were on the tour, we'd been there about three days. And I said, tell me, you've been all over the world. How 
do all those places compare to Israel? He looked at me and said, not even close. Nothing close to it. If you had your choice of going anywhere in the world, ladies and gentlemen, trust me, I've been a few places. I've been to Egypt. I've been to Syria. I've been to Turkey. I've been to Israel. I've been to Jordan. I've been to Germany. I've been to France. I've been to England. I've been to Belgium. I've been many places, Nigeria. I've been to South America, to Chile. I've been all over. I know what I'm talking about. Nothing close to Israel. If you've never been, you've got to go. It will absolutely revolutionize your life. Uh, so there's still a few places left, but don't wait because the time is running out. We're just a little less than 30 days away when you gotta pull the trigger. So do it now. Just call us, the number to call is 1-800-END-TIME and uh, my daughter and my granddaughter are standing by. They take care of the tours for us. They know what they're talking about. They've uh, now organized many, many tours. They're very good at what they do. They will help you. Uh, they'll give you the information you need. Now, just by calling does not mean you make a commitment, but they'll give you the information. So call 1-800-END-TIME, ask to speak to someone about the tour, and they'll send you straight to them. But if you can go with us, and oh, one more thing. We've made many wonderful friends on this trip because we're with you all day, every day. We're on the buses with you. We eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner with you. Uh, we have prophecy briefings at different places we stop where prophecies are being fulfilled or will soon be fulfilled. It's a prophecy tour. So you not only get a trip to Israel and get the history, you get the future as well. And that's the reason we think our tour is one of the best you could ever take. So call us 800 in time. Let's get right back to the phones now. And uh, let's go to, uh, let's go to Bonnie calling from Illinois. Hello, Bonnie. Hi, um, are you planning a trip for, I think it's next spring. I don't know exactly what the dates are, but there's a, a I've seen some uh, announcements that there's going to be some kind of acknowledgement, celebration about the winning of the Six Days War and the um, winning over uh, the Temple Mount and I guess whatever else they got out of that. Yeah, Bonnie, what actually happened was they uh, not only conquered all of Jerusalem, reuniting Jerusalem, and they actually every year celebrate what they call Jerusalem Day, the day that Jerusalem was reunited, which happened during the Six-Day War. But beyond that, they conquered the area of Judea, Samaria, which now they're under tremendous pressure to surrender to the Palestinians so they can have their state there. Nevertheless, uh, they do celebrate it every year, but probably at the 30-year uh, anniversary, it will be special. We're actually I scheduled to be in Israel. Anniversary? Pardon? Uh, won't this be the 40 or 50-year anniversary? Uh, actually, actually, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It happened in 67, which means it'll be the 50th anniversary. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. It'll be the 50th anniversary, and we will be there. I think we've already got our date set, something like April the 30th uh, through uh, 14 days from there. I do not know exactly the date that will fall on. We will be very, very close to the time. I'm promising you they will have Israeli flags all over Israel preparing for that celebration. So we are going there. We're going there. I'm almost sure the date, I just heard the date the other day, April the 30th, I believe we're leaving here and we'll be there the first two weeks of May. So uh, that's going to be something you can look forward to. So is that, so uh, it's going to be more than just a week long? Is it going to be like for our trip is for going to be a year or? Our, our trip is going to be a combination of Israel and Rome in the spring. Uh, we're going to spend, I uh, think, 11 days in Israel, and then we will spend three days in Rome. 
Uh, so it's going to be a great, great trip. The reason we're going to, it's going to be a double whammy, actually. Not only will we be there for the 50th anniversary of the reunification of Jerusalem, but we're going to be in Rome for the 500th anniversary of the nailing of the 95 Theses to the door of the church at Wittenberg by Martin Luther. And in 2017, many Protestants are planning on s declaring the Protestant movement over because now they agree with the Roman Catholic Church on the doctrine of justification by faith. And there's already plans for them to go to Rome. And that's the reason we decided to do both Israel and Rome. So it's going to be a banner year. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. Um, I'm a, a born again Christian now, but I was raised Lutheran. So I learned about uh, in school. I went to Lutheran school for my first six years and learned all about that. But I have a quick Question. I don't. I just thought of this while you were talking about the um, your October trip. Um, is Mormonism? Um, I've been having a discussion with a Mormon recently. Um, is Mormonism part of this uh, ecumenical movement or this uh, 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 United Faith movement uh, that you know, like towards the one? World Church, are they involved in this too? Uh, I'm pretty sure that they are, Bonnie. Uh, I cannot speak with total authority on that because I haven't studied that particular question, but I believe that they are, uh, they are involved in the interfaith, the ecumenical movement and the interfaith movement. And I'm sorry, I can't give you more definite information. I'll have to look into that further. Well, it, what's interesting, I'll, I'll say this, are you still there? Yes, I sure am. Oh, okay. I heard a click, and I thought, like, okay, I guess my call is over. Um, one of the things that I just recently learned about uh, what the Mormons believe is that they are the uh, uh, re, uh, restored Christian church. And that can't be if their church is... Um, going into this one world government of the Antichrist. So that's something to keep in mind for um, people when they are trying to talk to Mormons about uh, what's coming yes. um, with the one world government. And they think they're the restored church. Yeah, Bonnie, they do teach that. They call themselves the, latter, the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Um, and so they do teach that. Uh, if people out there are interested we have a DVD called True Christianity versus False Christianity. Jesus said in the last days that many people would come under the name of Christian and would deceive many. He said that in Matthew 24. It's about verse uh, 4, 5, and 6. Uh, he said to his disciples, Beware lest any man deceive you, for many will come in my name and will deceive many. The Bible teaches that most of Christianity will go into deception and we'll end up in alliance with the Antichrist. And so uh, Bonnie's raising a very, very important question here. So that tape, but let me warn you, if you don't love the truth, don't get that tape because it's really, really strong. There's no holds barred. I tell the whole truth there. So if you don't really love the truth, just don't get the tape because you'll end up mad at me. And I don't want you mad at me because I'm a nice guy. So anyway, uh, Bonnie, I'm gonna let you go because I need to move on Thank to the you. next caller. But thank you for, very much for your call. Appreciate it. Uh, let's go now. Oh, by the way, if you want to order that, uh, just call 1-800-IN-TIME and say, I want the tape, True Christianity versus False Christianity. They will probably tell you it's part of our salvation package. And if you can get it all, I'd get, it all, I'd get all four DVDs because you need them all. But if you only want the one, get that one, True Christianity versus False Christianity. Let's go now to Tennessee. Johnny's calling. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Brother Baxter. Yes, Johnny. What's on your mind? Yeah, I, um, I've been calling my senators and congressmen to, uh, to find out if they know anything about the uh, surrendering of the Internet by the Obama administration on October the 1st. Yes. And they don't, according to them, they don't have any clue about it. Well, I don't know if they're giving me the runaround or they're just uh, you know, not interested in talking about it. But, uh, you know, <laughs> well, they are either poor congressmen and senators because it is happening. It's all you have to do is uh, 
talk about, uh, I've, I've got it pulled up in front of me right now, an internet giveaway to the UN from the, um, I think it's the Wall Street Journal has a big article on it four days ago, an internet giveaway to the UN. I have another article in front of me from Breitbart, UN could take over ICON and the internet by October the 1st. So it's everywhere. If your congressmen and senators are not up to date, they must be too busy out kissing babies and running for office. Right, right. Um, now, I asked him if, if this kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 action would, would take the, uh, the approval of Congress, and they couldn't even tell me that. You know, I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. No, it, is, like, <laughs> it does not take the approval com of Congress. Frankly, it's already been decided, and that's horrible, but that's where we are right now. Okay, so this Obama did it by, what, executive order? Is that, what, is that what, how they did this? Uh, I don't even know whether that was required or not. I cannot tell you the exact mechanics of it, but nevertheless, it's happening. If you'll go to the Internet and just say, who will take over the Internet? You'll see a lot of articles there. You can read all about it there, Johnny. Um, now, the other thing, I call, I call the United Nations, and, uh, okay, I ask them about that and all the stuff, and they say, well, they, they said that, you know, it's going to be a good thing for the world and this and that, and, uh, and we are not going to censor anybody and everything, you know. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're lying right there because I know it. When well, they take over the Internet, they're going to censor everything. Johnny, they're you know, going to tell you they're not going to censor anything, and they may mean that. But wait till Adolf Hitler takes over and you'll find out what will be censored and what will not be censored. Of course, Adolf Hitler is not going to take over. Someone worse than Adolf Hitler is going to take over. He's called the beast in the Bible or the Antichrist. And they will definitely use the Internet as another means of controlling the entire world. Johnny, thank you very much for your call. I am out of time, so I have to let you go. Uh, one more time, let me remind you, if you'd like to go to Israel with Judy and I, we're leaving October the 27th. We still have a little bit of room. It is going to be a marvelous tour. If you can go, go. You say, is it safe? It's safer than the U.S., I promise you. Uh, right now, Israel's in a wonderful place. I talked to my friends in Israel just today, actually, and they've been telling me, that their streets are full of people, that the fear has subsided, the stabbings have gone away. And even while the stabbings were happening, we were there. Um, and it was much safer there than it certainly is in Chicago. A nation of seven million people, uh, well, they lost uh, 30 people in six months. Chicago lost 360 in six months. So uh, don't believe all the scare stories. It's wonderfully safe. If you'd like to go with us, call us right now. If you'd like to get your own copy of Understand the End Time, Call us 800 in time is the number to call. God bless you all. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. End of the Age is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom.